Hello, hello. Welcome to the podcast or if you're watching us on YouTube, wherever you are. I'm here today with Louise O'Reilly and I uh, I must have found you in the Heart Centre group around Australia Day one year and yeah, I found just such a powerful connection coming from you. I don't know if you feel it from others, but I just felt like, oh, finally someone's talking about all of this and it just felt like such a relief and so much permission. I'm just getting full goosebumps now just thinking about it because of all the pain that everybody has around everything that happens in Australia. And, yeah, I'd love you to introduce yourself, what you do to everybody. Sure. Well, first of all, what an amazing memory you have. I don't think I ever remember how I meet people. Oh, yes. Yeah. I just never do. It's it's the strangest thing. So yeah. awesome. Yay for you for remembering Thanks. that interaction. And I'm so glad that uh, what I was sharing resonated with you. It's such mm. a pleasure to be here. Um, for those of you listening or watching, my name's Louise O'Reilly. I'm a Wadawa Noonga Aboriginal woman. Um, I am an inclusion, diversity, equity and allyship coach and mentor. And I help business owners be inclusive in their business, learn how to do that Mm. and learn how to do it in a way that is aligned to you, your soul, your brand Mm. um, and your mission in life as well. I want Mm. inclusion to be something that is becomes an everyday normal natural thing part of business. So it's about changing the culture of how we do business as well because Mm. I can see that uh, how it is currently is sitting within the status quo. It is sitting within that patriarchal system. It is sitting within the the privileged system. And mm-hmm. it's it's very exclusionary. It's very oppressive. And all those kinds of things are not good for anyone. So I'm looking to change all of that and create a more inclusive world. Yeah, I love it. And I think one of the first things I did in terms of working with you was the Acknowledgement of Country Workshop. Mm-hmm which I recommend to everybody because everybody responds so um, positively to my acknowledgement on my website. And that felt like such a gift because as as a white Australian, there's so much I want to learn and it feels like the channels have been closed, say, in the 80s and 90s when I was really just trying to find out, like, how can we fix this and how do we heal this? And I'm so grateful that you know, I was able to learn acknowledgement of country from a person who is an Australian, you know, an original Australian person. And what I loved about it was like just hearing you speak then, I'm like, yeah, daddy, like ranty. But your <laughs> thinking is like, yes, ranty, I can like get my angry feminist, you know, on. But also I love it that your practices are so open hearted and so personal. Like I just sobbed so much in that workshop just the beautiful um, spiritual awareness and kindness to self that you share. So it's very balanced, the work that you offer. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of, do you mind if I do an acknowledgement of country? Oh, yes, please. Okay. I, I love doing these and I often do get emotional when I deliver them and I deliver them almost daily. So mm-hmm. that's saying a lot. Yeah. Um, so I, Louise O'Reilly of the Wadawa Noongar people, would like to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation as the traditional and ongoing custodians of the lands and waters on which I am coming to you from. I pay respects to the elders and thank them for their community leadership, their guidance, their love and everything they do in this space. And see, I'm getting emotional now. <laughs> Um, I would like to also acknowledge the custodians on the lands on which you are listening or watching from as well and pay respects to the elders in whatever title they refer to themselves there. Thank you. It's such a special thing to be able to do an acknowledgement. It really, really is. It is deep. It is spiritual. It is connecting. It is so much more than words. Yeah, and I think the practice that you teach made it really mine it felt like a proper lineage that I'd learnt it from, you know, an Indigenous person and um, I love doing it. What I especially love is that you said the spirits love hearing the name of the land. Yeah. So I'm on the Yuan country, the Dirangang people's land, and I love it here. The spiritual integrity of the land here is so rich and I really pay my respects to the elders for looking after that here. It's so palpable It's a beautiful area, but there is such a richness here. Now I'm getting emotional that it's just really real. And I really came to understand, um, you know, 
I'd heard people talking about the land and how the land is the teacher, the land is the connection. The land is kind of the whole religion almost or the whole construct of the Indigenous belief and culture, which was a bit abstract for me. But when I came here, it became so real and I really think that's because of the elders. So I do pay my respects to them for just keeping all that so rich here. Yeah, the land is our mother. It's As Aboriginal people, we are born from the land. Mm. And we are responsible to the land. So we are here. That custodianship is to care for the land, mm. to love it, to nurture it, um, not only on a physical space but in a spiritual, uh, energetic space as well. Mm. And with that, we know that if if the land is healthy and happy and thriving, the land will always provide for us and care for us like a mother does. Mm. And then once we pass, we return back to the land. So mm. it's a beautiful thing to have that connection and know where your lands are because we all belong to a land. Mm. We are all here to be connected to and be responsible to some land. Mm. Yeah, it's such an interesting journey. It also makes me think about, so then I was also in the Inclusion Creators membership for a little while and what I loved about my time there was really um being encouraged to seek my own culture and to start questioning that. And yeah. like both my parents' families came here or well, my dad migrated here when he was 17 and then my mum's family migrated here in the Second World War. And um, I feel like that's such an issue in Australia that the Indigenous people, like, you know, the, the long-time owners of this land have felt disassociated culturally and then so many people have migrated here in the shorter and longer term that as a country with there's this real cultural breakdown you know that is yeah. healing starting to heal now mm -hmm. so yeah it's been a big journey for me to try to figure out what is my culture so that I'm not appropriating and it's a just a big journey and also to just be okay with feeling like this is my land here, you know, feeling very at home yeah. on this land here even though I'm not Indigenous Australian. Yeah, and that's part of, so when you have people who are working to be allies of marginalised communities and working to be inclusive, um, there are four aspects of doing the work that I talk about. Mm -hmm. And one of that, one of those is uh, privilege, unpacking your privilege and bias unconscious biases um, another part of it is doing the listening and learning to marginalized people uh, listening to their stories and believing them and understanding that uh, lived experiences are different depending on what privilege you have so how you believe and know the world to operate and work is very different depending on the types of privilege you have mm. um, the third one is that reconnection. What I'm what I'm coining it as reconnection. Yeah. And I'm saying reconnecting back to your heritage, reconnecting back to your ancestors, your lands, your culture, your songs, your stories, your all of those things. Um, and I'm getting goosebumps just talking about this. It's so vital, mm -hmm. I feel, in terms of knowing who you are. And how you fit into the story of inclusion, but how you also fit in the universe in general, it yeah. helps to understand your place because you have a place here. It's important that you are here. Uh, but what I've found and what I've been talking about recently on my Facebook page, um, I've been doing weekly Facebook Lives on different um, topics around uh, inclusion in business. And one of the things I talk about is that white supremacy um, now, there is nothing wrong with, I'm going to preface this, there is nothing wrong with being white, yeah. um, just like there's nothing wrong with being black or being Aboriginal or anything like that. Yeah. But what you have is a system of white supremacy where being white and this concept of whiteness um, is superior to all other beings on mm, earth. Mm. Um, and now whiteness doesn't always necessarily talk about the colour of skin either. So mm. whiteness is a very fluid subject that can change. You can be white enough. Well, usually it's not enoughness, not white enoughness. Mm. Um, so you have that overarching um, real system, which is white supremacy. And underneath that, are things like racism and genderism and ableism and colorism, Eurocentrism, all of them 
fall under that big umbrella of white mm -hmm. supremacy. And that white supremacy is one who decides who is better groups of humans in each of those categories. And what it's done is it's actually stripped people of their culture, mm. people of their connections. Mm. And so something I'm talking about is how these systems of oppression, which all fall under that white supremacy umbrella, they work to systematically remove you from your own culture, remove mm. you from your own heritage, mm. remove you from your own customs and rituals and language and everything that makes you a unique person and makes up your family storyline. Mm. It is stealing stuff away from everyone. everyone so although doesn't. the privileged system benefits more people than other people, it actually is a uh, something that acts to remove the uniqueness of you, the specialness of you, the story of you, the connections of you. Mm -hmm. That's what it does. So no one actually benefits from the system that we're currently living in. Exactly. And that reminds me, a friend of mine is a teacher at the local school and they had a day where um, a local language expert came in and they basically went around the circle and all shared about language because that was the focus of the day and also their parents um, and my friend who happens to be, his name's James Cook, which he has this big joke because he works with loads of Indigenous people locally for Bush Regen and they all just yeah. think he's taking the piss when he tells them his yeah. name is James Cook. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I bet that would be a big laugh. It's funny. And he's from England. Irony. It's unbelievable. He's from England and he feels such a connection with the land because he has many generations of his family have lived on the same land in England. Uh, so that's one piece. But the other piece was he, for him as a white man to hear stories of people, yes, Indigenous people, but also, um, you know, like, oh, one woman, you know, my family was Polish Um when we moved here, he, my father was told he can't speak his language, like that a yeah. lot of people, my, uh, migrants and, you know, all yeah. kinds of Australians have had their culture, yeah, like washed out of them or forced or coerced or, you know, uh, un, like traumatically removed and the cultural severance of that and the impact of that. This is the most goosebumps I've ever had in an interview ever just talking about, all oh, this is all my favourite <laughs> things to talk about. So, yeah, it doesn't benefit anybody at all to no. continue. And I guess that's the thing, isn't it? It's what are the next steps? You know, where can we have an influence? And as business people, we do our marketing. And I think it's, you know, an idea you had to discuss inclusive marketing. So I think that's a great thing to try and support people with because we do need to market. And I've been thinking a lot lately, especially about um people's sovereignty, like the word sovereignty yeah. really activated in me at the moment. Um, I went to the tent embassy in Canberra and Murray there told me that, um, I mean, everything he told me was just a big focus on sovereignty. Like he said, oh, yeah, we don't want to change the date anymore. We want to have Sovereignty Day and um, that they've changed the flag to this different flag. I'll share a link to it somewhere for people, which is he said it's a war flag because we're actually still, you know, activated as this is war and the flags at half mass is super powerful being there. But he was talking all about sovereignty and then I feel like in marketing, giving our clients sovereignty, sovereignty as in, I don't really want to coerce people to buy my stuff. Yeah. I just want to let them know that this is what I'm up to and just leave the sovereignty, the responsibility, the ownership with them to choose and not be manipulative and not be trying to be influencing people. So that's one way that I'm aware, you know, of giving sovereignty to the audience and to mm -hmm. the customer. I'm super interested in any tips you've got as well for inclusive marketing. Absolutely. I do want to uh, start off by saying, you know, that Aboriginal people are not homogenous in yeah. the things that we believe and the things that we think. Yeah. Um, so, yes, there are resistances um, to what is happening here in Australia. There's resistance to colonisation. There's resistance to the, the systems that are oppressing Aboriginal people. Uh, but it's really important to understand we are individuals that 
exist in a community of people. We do have a lot of shared experiences, but we also have a lot of um, experiences that aren't shared. And we have a lot of beliefs that uh, we, we don't always agree on everything. Mm. So um, it's it's really important to not what we call flattening. We're flattening a group of people. Yeah. So understanding that, yes, there is one person who believes in these certain things and are doing these kinds of resistances or these kinds of protests or these try- types of um, social movements, that doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean everyone in that community is in agreement with those things. So I think it's really important to have that, understand that nuance with it, that we are still complex whole human beings with our own experiences, our own desires, our own um everything that comes along with being a human. So the best thing you can do is really make sure you're listening to a lot of different people mm. from within communities and not taking what one person says as gospel as to what is happening with the whole community. Mm. I think that's really important for a lot of people to know. And this is also why uh, people sometimes ask me things like, why isn't there a single name for this landmass? Mm. Uh, why isn't there a like a national anthem for Aboriginal people? <laughs> why isn't there all these all these little bits and pieces and questions? And it's understanding that sovereignty mm. that we are sovereign within our own communities. We're sovereign first of all as individuals, mm. but we're sovereign within our own communities, our language groups, and our countries. And then we are linked in with each other and connected with each other in beautiful, wonderful ways. Um, so that that's a, a good, I think, part into sovereignty, but also understanding sovereignty in terms of uh, a business and its communication with its audience or with, you know, your ideal clients in your niche is as it stands, how business operates we have like these standard practices things that are socially acceptable right this is how business is socially expected to operate or socially expected to do this 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 and this mm-hmm. tick all those boxes expectations of entrepreneurship tick yeah. those boxes of being small business owner all these different things mm-hmm. that doesn't allow sovereignty mm-hmm. because they are social norms, unwritten rules, Mm. they are things like folkways and mores that make up these weird rules that how you have to do stuff. Mm. And a lot of people who own businesses really struggle in that system Mm. because a lot of us who are creating businesses and business owners, we see things and we go, this isn't working. Something mm. is wrong here mm. and I have a solution to this, which is mm. might be something different that's been offered before. Mm. And so we've we got the intention of stepping out of the mould, but yet we have to still fit within the mould what's expected within that business. Mm. So having your own sovereignty is to sit back and understand what are my personal values? What is my story? What is my culture? What are, What is my mission? What am I here to do? Mm. And then going, I don't care what these rules are around mm. business. Yeah, These are Eurocentric rules mm. and we don't have to abide by them. So having that sovereignty to know yourself and then allowing yourself to be expressed through your business, mm. you know, you bring up values like you want to be inclusive. That's what might be a value of yours or you want kindness or compassion. You are uh, knowledge seeker. Whatever it is, you want to evoke um, peace or harmony or freedom is your thing. For me, at the moment, liberty is a massive thing for me. Mm. Liberation is a massive mm. thing for me in my business. Um, once you get those and take hold of them, you can then allow yourself to know that is your guiding point. Mm. And being humans, and usually we're really heart-centred, really compassionate, really caring, we don't like that people are treated badly. We don't Mm. like that human rights are denied from some groups of people and others. Mm. We don't like that sometimes business isn't accessible to Mm. all groups of people. We don't Mm. like those things as just human to human. We don't like those things. The thing is you don't have to do business in a way that supports that system anymore. Mm. We're becoming more aware 
that we don't have to play the game like that anymore. Mm. These are social norms, which mean they were created by humans and we're humans. So we get to decide if we want to change the culture and create new norms. Like mm. a new norm that we're creating now is doing acknowledgements of country. Mm. Ten years ago, that wasn't a thing. Mm. We as humans are deciding the minimum standard is an acknowledgement of country now. Mm. And if you don't do it, socially, it, we're going to be displeased with that yeah. business for not doing those things. Yeah, love that. Thank you. I just get blown away every time I hear you talk at how intelligent <laughs> you are and how human and and loveful that you are. I don't have better so words because yeah. I'm super emotional. But, um, yeah, I love that. I was thinking also about um something and I've just lost my brain for a second. But that was great. That's okay. You asked about the next step. Mm-hmm. So for people who are listening, mm. the next step is that listening and learning piece. Mm. Really take a look through your social media feed. Scroll. Mm. Look at all the people who are in there. Do they all kind of look the same? Do they mm. all kind of have the same kind of background? Are they saying all the same things that you already think? Mm. That in itself is an invitation to open up your social media feed and seek out people with different points of view, Mm. people with different backgrounds, people who look different to you, Mm. people with different stories, and not jump in to provide solutions or um, combat in any way, but just be there to listen Mm. and allow yourself to open your paradigm of understanding that different people with different levels of privilege experience different um the world differently Mm. experience people differently social Mm. situations differently and with that expansion you can start to then look back into your own business and go am I actually expressing my business in a way that is making people feel excluded Mm. am I denying the existence of certain groups of people Mm. uh am I not being as inclusive as I could be or maybe am I not being as accessible as I could be as there's something I can tweak Mm. and asking yourself those kinds of questions when you look at that and then also look at what is your privilege, you can have a really great understanding of how you fit in the conversation. Mm. If you're at the privileged end of the scale for a particular um, spectrum of oppression slash privilege, um, for instance, colorism, if you're Mm. at that white end of that spectrum, you're in that privileged space. And if you are a a person of color, black uh, or indigenous, with those particular ones, if you are at the white end of the scale, that's a space where you can amplify voices. Yeah. So you don't have to come up with solutions. You just share what people in that oppressed group are saying. You support them. They're calling for you to do certain things. Yeah. So that's a space where you can do that. In other instances where you might be on the oppressed end of the scale, and this quite often is um, women will fall into the oppressed end and From that space, you can speak about what's wrong. You can speak about the challenges you're experiencing because of your womanhood. You can um, share solutions and all those kinds. This is where you can use your voice. So it's really great to understand where you're privileged and where you're oppressed because that guides you as to what you can actually talk about, what is appropriate for you to talk about because the people who are the oppressed peoples are the closest to the solutions because they can see all the challenges. Mm. They can see and know all the complexities and nuances with the existence of that um, community of people. Yeah. So we need to listen to those people. Yeah. Listen, 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 and then look. As an ally, and I'd hate the word ally, I really don't because I don't feel we're at war at all. Mm. War is not. We mm. are in a social movement together, Mm. a social evolution, a social bettering. Mm. And so we can look at ourselves and go, this particular oppressed group is calling for this kind of solution. Mm. As an ally, do I have the resources? Do I have the capacity? Do I have the funds? Do I have what can I do to fulfil this calling? Yeah, and that makes me think of this guy, well, of a person I saw recently who 
is a they and their um, beautiful person who was calling out to allies because they ended up on a really famous American morning talk show and they were saying, look, allies, I, I got all this publicity. I got so much negative comments and what you really could do now is come into that space and you know be present because yeah. I think he was like they were saying a lot of people worry about saying the right thing yeah they just didn't care about getting pronouns right or calling them a he or she or any of that like just don't worry about getting it wrong what we do know is what's like you were saying we do know what's good and we do know what's kind and if you see someone who is oppressed getting slammed in comments yeah. that that's one way as well that you can pop yeah. in and interrupt that behavior I mean we're smart we we are living with privilege like get into that space be brave enough to interrupt that behavior because a bystanderism is you're complicit if you're a bystander right if you're not yes. interrupting it you yes. are you know, you are allowing it to continue. I'm always yeah. raising my kids up to interrupt behaviours. So we're all yeah. massive interrupters over here. And my partner, I was drilling him the other day about interrupting because, yeah, if you're not interrupting, you're allowing it to continue. And it's such an easy thing to do to just support someone or just let someone know, oh, I think you're being unkind <laughs> or yes. angry or however you have to do it. Yeah. There's yes, yes. There's, there's, there's two things I want to talk about with this particular thing. First of all, quite often we will have experiences um, where we won't say something, we won't mm. step in, um, yeah. and we will feel terrible afterwards. Yeah. And we'll feel so guilty for not standing up. I do not want people to walk away with guilt from those situations mm -hmm. because that particular situation has taught you what feels aligned for you. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you've walked away and you felt bad about not interrupting or not speaking up about whatever's going on tells you it's part of you to say something. Yeah. So you're prepared bit, yeah. for the next time it happens yeah. and there will be a next time mm -hmm. because so our society is rampant with this kind of um, conversation and treatment of other other humans. Mm. So it will come up again. So I don't want people to come in and carry the guilt and carry the mm. shame along. Mm. It happened. It was an experience. It taught you something mm. and it taught you to prepare for the next time. The mm. next time you will be ready to go mm. and you don't have to hold whatever has happened. It is a great learning. It's a great lesson to have. Um, so that's one thing. The next thing I want to talk about is understanding as an ally where you stand in comparison to those marginalised people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you're behind, sometimes you're alongside, sometimes you're in front, mm -hmm. and it depends on the type of situation you're in. So the moments where you are standing behind in support is in um, events and contexts where those marginalised people are calling for particular solutions. Mm -hmm. So when we're saying um, we need uh, this particular thing to change, that's when you stand behind. Yes, I stand here. I'm not saying anything. I'm standing here in support of. I stand behind you supporting you and your leadership in this movement. Mm -hmm. In situations where we do need your voice to be part of the numbers, things like voting, Mm -hmm. We need you to stand alongside us because the number of votes we get to support um, Aboriginal people or other marginalised people, your count matters towards that. Mm -hmm. So you can listen to what we're calling for and then you can make educated votes based on those things. This is when you need to stand alongside us because your vote is equal to our vote. Mm -hmm. Then there's other situations where it's good for you to stand in front of us. And these are situations where we are being attacked mm. by some, in some way, mm. um, where if we are, for instance, if we get in trouble with authorities, um, the penalty is probably going to be much greater for Aboriginal people or other marginalised groups of people mm. than someone who is a um, most privileged person mm. in the society. So jump in front and protect 
Mm. So there is a space for allies in every single situation and there is a space for businesses in every single situation. So businesses can speak up, up about the injustices that are going on. Businesses can change and innovate the way they're doing business to be more inclusive and really learn how to be more inclusive and make their spaces a space where marginalised people aren't fearing to come into because in all honesty, in real truth, there are so many businesses out there that put off so many huge red flags and they are completely unaware of it. Mm. Um, a lot of these businesses I would never do business with because mm. just in the way you speak, mm. just in what you're putting out, I can tell there's underlying things that are going to um, potentially put me at risk of being harmed by you. Mm. And so working on those unconscious biases really work. But doing all those different bits and pieces, it doesn't have to be something that basically takes over your life. It is something that the more you get exposed to the stories, um, the culture, mm. uh, different bits and pieces will add to the building blocks and your foundations of opening your mind to inclusion and mm. how to do those things and how to be a great ally and mm. how to do all the things that are going to create that more inclusive world. Yeah. I thought we were just going to have a short chat, but we're just going to go the distance. <laughs> <laughs> so I have two more things I want to talk to you about. <laughs> up, go like, for while it. While I have you. <laughs> um, one of them is, like when you were talking before, when I had my mind blank, because I was trying to retain so many ideas at once, um, about being an entrepreneur, I feel like there's this structure, it's part of the whole oppressive system, where we're taught not to be sovereign, like we're taught to abdicate mm -hmm. responsibility to, you know, the parent, the teacher, the doctor, whatever it is, you know. Yeah. And that that's an opportunity that we get to grow through as an entrepreneur because we're stepping knowingly or unknowingly we step into this we don't I don't think I knew at the time how radical it is to be a woman in business to yeah. actually not be an employee to not yeah. have a boss making all the decisions for you it yeah. is so triggering like every single day for all of us mm -hmm. but it is a very powerful position to be in to choose sovereignty and to choose self-responsibility so yeah there's a lot involved that there is getting educated and there is also this piece about being super resilient like that's another thing I learned from the inclusion creators was like we, we're going to get it wrong you know we, yeah. we're going to get it wrong yeah and, most likely <laughs> and, and that's okay it's so fine and I, I feel like like I read um white fragility I don't know there's lots of um, mixed opinions about that book but I think that as a white person that level of discomfort is just so small compared to people who are living with a lot of oppression who experience that not just like when they get it wrong one time but there are so many entrenched layers of continual discomfort for people who are you know marginalized that it's just a little taste girlfriend you know like just fucking get used to it a bit <laughs> because that's only just the tiniest taste of the level of discomfort that people are living with so many layers and so much all of the time so yeah you're going to make mistakes you know you're yeah. going to not take action when you wish you did you're going to get the pronouns wrong you're going to get it all wrong <laughs> and it's okay yeah. like just yeah. learning to live with all of that and and take the opportunity that we are as entrepreneurs of we don't have a boss. No one's going to tell us what no. to do. We have to figure it all out ourselves. Like, yeah, <laughs> I'm stoked about yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And knowing at the same time that those feelings are completely valid as well, mm. um, that they exist. And I think it's important not to push those away, that, that there is that discomfort, but mm. really to deepen yourself and contemplate that discomfort where is that coming from where did it originate why are you feeling this way what is something that can um, ease this discomfort and looking at those kinds of questions and not just accepting and looking at surface level this I'm uncomfortable and then going okay I'm uncomfortable that's okay and then end mm. the story mm. let's look at that a little bit deeper and go okay well we want 
allies to be 100%, right? This is my this is my thing. I want allies to be at 100%. I want them to feel confident. I want them to feel, um, you know, high vibrational when they are being allies because at the end of the day, we are doing something that's going to equate to a better world, mm-hmm. a more inclusive world, a more accepting, loving uh, world where we can feel safe and free to express mm-hmm. ourselves in our authenticity. Mm. So why would you not be excited about that stuff? Why would you not be high vibrational about that stuff? Yeah. That's really huge. That is radical. That is rebellion. Yeah. To dream that, to want that, and then to take action towards it. Mm. So I think that coming to that uncomfortableness gets you to a, a certain point. But if you can go deeper than that, I think real beauty can Mm. come out and Mm. that real sovereignty and understanding of who you are and how you're going to contribute to this world and you leave your legacy Mm. comes out from that yeah and that makes me think of like I'm super freaking white my partner is super freaking white and our kids are super freaking white I have two boy kids so I have white men like I live in this house of just white men (laughs) which is great and it drives me crazy and my thing that I would love to receive if you have something to share is they're beautiful men my men because they're raised by such a radical half crazy um mega feminist you know anarchist so they are good (laughs) but there is a place where I'm trying to explain privilege to people who really have not like they kind of don't get it because yeah if you're a white woman yeah you understand how it is to be oppressed as a woman but you don't really understand what it's like to be oppressed because you're physically able because you're white yes so as a woman we kind of have a little gateway in but to a man I'm just struggling how to explain to a white man what is their privilege when like probably the biggest hardship they've ever had is something like oh, yeah, my girlfriend broke up with me and I was sad for a year. Or, oh, when I was 20, I had kind of a rough time and didn't have any direction in life. Mm-hmm. I smoked a bit too much weed. Like, I'm like, is that the hardest thing you've ever fucking experienced, mate? Like, come on. Like, yeah. how can I, how do you explain privilege to people who have basically just had a, such a perfect trauma-free upbringing? <laughs> well, I think um, coming at it with the from a space of neutrality, I think is really right. important. So having no expectations of changing people's minds yeah. um, or belief systems or anything like that, but just coming at it with respectful communication to just share something and be able to listen to what they've got to say and be open to, um, you know, altering what you believe about certain situations because of that interaction. I think Mm. that's a beautiful space to come to because once you leave from that interaction, whether they've changed any opinions or thoughts or anything, it actually doesn't matter Mm. because social movement is about individuals choosing to change their behaviour and interact socially in a different way. Mm. So that's social change in itself. You don't actually, we're not here to... um, to tell people what to do or how mm. to think or anything like that. Mm. So if we can stay, again, back to sovereignty, sovereign within ourselves and our own decisions on how we live, mm. how we behave, how mm. we uh, do business, all those kinds of things, that's important. Mm. And a lot of the time it doesn't even come down to conversation. It comes down to role modelling. Yeah, people will see you role model. Yeah, And when you have that space of, neutrality where you're not there is no expectations on changing people's minds or thoughts or opinions Mm. that is beautiful openness and spaciousness because they know you're not trying to make them do something Mm. so it allows space for curiosity Mm. it allows space for questioning and knowing that a single conversation is not going to change everything Mm. but allowing so I like to think of it that you don't want to have everything shifted in one conversation. Mm. It's a conversation, which means it's always a back and forth, back and forth, back and Mm. forth. So if you can have those conversations, which just give a little bit of a seed of something Mm. in there and allow them time and space to contemplate that. And then for that conversation to be such a um, 
respectful and open one that they're willing to come back to you and go, you know, when we were talking about the other thing, I've thought about it a little bit. Can we talk about that a bit more? Mm. And having it so they feel safe enough to come back and continue the conversation mm. over and over and over and over again. Mm. So then it slowly evolves with them. They have a greater understanding. That's a beautiful thing to do. Um, but not only that, allowing representation to happen. So it doesn't have to come from you. Allow mm. them to hear the stories from other people that it's actually impacting and affecting Mm. allow them to see different representations of different people not even on the subject or the topic of social injustice or Mm. oppression in any way but just as humans so they become um they can see how their humanness is connected Mm. they can see their how they're actually connected and related and their commonalities so it's not like a difference there is no othering they become more and more human the Mm. more that representation is happening in front of their own eyes. So those kinds of things can can help. And definitely talking about um, something in my household. Yes, it's wonderful to get grades, um, grades in all different subjects. But the thing that I tell my children that I value the most over everything is that social interaction part. Hmm. If they are kind and considerate to others in the in the school community and that's a high, that to me, oh, I'm getting emotional. <laughs> that's the best thing. You can learn subjects. You can learn yeah. topics. Yeah. But human skills, human to human skills are the most important thing to ever have. Mm, thank you. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me how powerful listening is because as rah-rah as I am about white male privilege I have some friends who really needed to talk about gender identity and we had so many conversations that was so uncomfortable and um, because we love each other so much we have so much safety with each other to express views that you know, you you would think, oh, God, I could never talk about that in public. And I just listened so hard to my friend and just, you know, held that safe space for her. So it's it's yeah. everything you said just reminded me of like, oh, I actually do know what to do and I just need to get out yeah. of my rah-rah and just listen. And I think that is a thing that is a part of that white supremacy and that oppression is and maybe a bit of an Australian, like a white Australian thing, is it's very difficult sometimes to have feisty conversations. People will call me argumentative, like, let's not argue about that. Yeah. I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not arguing. Yeah. I just want to talk about things and I fully still love you. And it's going yeah. to get heated because we care. But in the end, yeah. that adds a lot of richness for me that I think is missing at times that real feisty combo yeah. just getting a bit razzed up and then you know being able to just walk away and let it sit and simmer and knowing that yeah we can come back to those conversations having yeah. evaluated and integrated all of that information mm. yeah yeah respectful debate is not something that is taught mm. um nor really socially accepted mm. in this country mm. um because you want the drama <laughs> the drama sells the stuff. Mm. I mean, you have to just even have a look at the way politicians behave mm. with each other. And it 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 disgusts me, in all honesty, absolutely disgusting, mm. that it comes down to mudslinging matches on a personal level mm. and not talking about how we get to the solutions. Mm. Even if we are on opposing sides, can we work together on something? that can come to this solution Mm. and not make it a personal argument, you know, attacking one another, being disrespectful to one another. Mm. It's something that we're not taught. But also there is this system within, um, certainly within government, that rewards quiet Australians. So you hear it and you can look it up, the quiet Australian, and politicians will say it over and over we will look after the quiet uh, the quiet australian mm. i know you quiet australians out there we we hear you we we we're, we're going to take care of you so you will be reward, rewarded if you are quiet mm. not make a noise 
don't don't cause a ruckus don't don't make a ripple Mm. we will look after you if you are quiet Mm. and so it's this systematic training of silence of people because if you are silent you would be you will be cared for interesting yeah yeah I have a, some a Spanish friend and a German friend that come to mind thinking about this and like in some class discussions you know we have meetings with the teacher and all the parents are there and the, there's some things that the Australians will all kick back and just let slide and the German parents that's the couple of them in one particular class they're just not going to let that slide and I think yeah. with Australia we're processing now and becoming more aware of all the horrible things that happened here and moving hopefully towards a richer and more conscious acknowledgement and reparation for everything that's happened. Whereas countries like Germany, where horrible things have happened, cultural shifts have emerged after that. So yes. now if you're Jewish, yes. you can actually go and go to university for free in Germany because and, and they're taught at school from a very young age of everything that happened. And there's no denial about yeah. what happened. It's like the whole yeah. country has really learned from that. And similarly in mm-hmm. Spain, my Spanish friend, they love having really razzed up conversations because they had the Catholic oppression and there was a period where people didn't stand up against that and that got their country in so much trouble as well as an older history with racism against Arabs who came up from the south. So I feel like there's a thing where those cultures are maybe thousands of years old and that the Australian, like the white Australian culture is only a couple of hundred years old, that we're just infantile and we haven't gone, yeah. we haven't really grieved and healed the damage that's been done. And that yeah. I'm hoping that we're moving towards that, you know, that we're yeah. going to be able to have these conversations and heal as a culture and come out yeah. better and stronger from all that's happened here. Yeah. Well, the thing is, it's still happening. Mm. And this is the problem. It's still currently happening. So if we talk about these kinds of conversations, they can be extremely comfortable because it might mean you are right now actively involved in that continuous damaging, that continuous harm Mm. that we're wanting to actually stop or prevent or the system we want to break down, you're actually involved in it right now. So that is really hard to process. Um, In other situations in in other parts of the world, events have happened Mm -hmm. and then they have kind of had an end point to it Mm -hmm. and then so that learning can happen. This happened, it was terrible, but there was some form of end-ish and ish, I'm not going to be really naive and go, there was an end point. There, there's not. Mm. It's, but there is some kind of point where you can see there is a turnover mm, of, true. from one view or one way of doing something into another. There was a revolution. Uh, we probably we, we haven't got that here. Mm. It's just a continuation of mm. colonisation still happening right now. Um, but also something that, A question that I pose um, or a thought that I put forward is, is it uncomfortable? Because if you have a look at the historic photos or the historic events, Mm. are you afraid you're going to see grandma or grandpa doing those horrible, hurtful, terrible things? And grandma is a sweet, sweet old lady sitting in a nursing room right now. There's no way. It messes with your concept of the types of people and types of relationships you have Mm. it messes with your concept of who that person is as a whole Mm. so will that disturb your concept of people you love very very dearly if you ever find out they were involved in something you think is so horrendous Mm. that's a really challenging thing and because it's only a couple of hundred years it's essentially only one or two generations that this has all happened in so People are still alive that were involved in those horrendous things. Mm. They're still alive. And the horrendous things that those things happen to are still alive. Mm. So it's current. It's not part, it's current right now. Yeah. Um, and it's and it's especially current um, when you look at Aboriginal people, the way we hold information and knowledge and share stories. So I know who was standing up here on um, Karakumba, Kings Park. I know the people who were standing on 
that park, currently that park, who saw the very first ships sail down that river mm. before any white person was ever here, before mm. colonisation happened here. I know who those people are. Mm. That's how current it is. Mm. I have the knowledge and I know the people before any of these houses were ever here, before any of these roads. It's not history. Mm. This is current. Yeah. And the thing with that is acknowledging that it is current mm. is really important and acknowledge that is continuing is really important. But with that, we can know the future hasn't happened yet. Mm. So what can we do to change the trajectory of the way our community and our nation is moving? And as business owners and entrepreneurs, we have massive potential for influence mm. because we have followers, we have an audience, we have email lists, we have people who look up to us and respect us. Mm. We have platforms where we can speak. We have platforms where we can pass the mic over. Mm. We have so much potential for influence. It's just wanting to make that sovereign decision within yourself. How do you want to run your business? Do you want it to be inclusive? Do you want it to be one that changes the story in Australia or do you want it to be one that just goes along with the status quo and exists? Do you want to leave a legacy? Mm. What is it that you want to be and do and bring into this world? Thank you. Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I really, really appreciate you making time to come and talk to me. And I feel like it's been a very rich conversation for anyone who's paying attention. I'm so excited to share this. And I would love for you to just share anywhere that people can find you, like your preferred way to be in touch. I mean, I personally would recommend that acknowledgement of country because so many people ask me um how do you do it? Plus it's an initiation. It's not just something you put on your footer. It's a spiritual yeah. initiation. So yeah. I would recommend that. But if you've got anything else that you want to suggest, I'd go for it. Oh, look, there's there's so many. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me into your space. I really appreciate it. This conversation I had has been phenomenal. I absolutely rich. loved it. I love it. Love it so much. Thank you so much. If you're still listening or watching <laughs> here, well done. Um, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, you can find me in, in, you know, on Facebook. You can find me on TikTok. You can find me on Instagram. They're my three top places you can find me. Um, my, you know, it's all Louise O'Reilly, so it's not that hard right. to find me. I do have pink hair, so you'll see <laughs> someone with pink hair. That, that's me. Um, <laughs> Um, and, you know, yes, definitely the Acknowledgement of Country Masterclass to make mm -hmm. um, your acknowledgements more meaningful and impactful. That's certainly a, a way to go. That is a paid course. But I have so many free courses as well, mm -hmm. so much free uh, resources. You can check out my um, blogs and my free stuff on my website, which is louiseoreilly.com.au. Um, I put a lot of the stuff there. Um I have a learning platform. I can, um, I will share so you can put it in the show notes yeah, yeah. in my learning yeah. platform where all my courses are held. Yeah, but awesome. I just, if anything, the thing I would love for you to do is just to come and connect with me on social media yeah, because that is a space so I love connecting with people. Yeah. Yeah. I I love to share so much stuff on there, and I'm not someone who likes to hold back on things. I'll just share, share, share because <laughs> I know that to work with me, it's not about all the knowledge that I have, although that's really, really great. It's also about my energy. Mm. I am um, my energy is something very different in the social movement space. Mm. It is very much focused on high vibrational future dreaming, imagining. So it's very strategy equally in with energy. Yeah. So it's equal equally masculine feminine energies that I bring to the space, but also my capacity um, to hold a space, safe space, non-judgmental space for allies yeah. is is crucial. You're not you don't have to do it alone. 
I can be there every single step of the way and I would be honoured to be able to be there with you through that inclusion journey. Mm. Um, so just connect. Come and say hi. I do weekly Facebook Lives on new new topics every single week. So come in, just drop by, ask some questions and, and let me know where you're coming from. So mm, that's the, the biggest thing really, connection. Yeah, I mean, genuinely just such a, you, I mean, I have to say you're just such a powerful healer and trans you know a, a catalyst for change and transformation I feel just I can't even I have to pinch myself can't believe I get to speak to you and um be in your energy field so thank you oh likewise you are amazing I love I love what you do I you are so bucking the system in such a beautiful way I love watching when you're coming up with new stuff because it's mm. like yes you're not you don't want to follow that that those expectations that Eurocentric way of doing things mm. I love it so much thank you all right well let's wrap it up I'm gonna click stop record look at me go <laughs> <laughs>